Peter Robbins is an investigative writer, author, and lecturer whose writing and research are focused on the subject of truly anomalous UFOs and their implications for humanity. His latest work is a documentary about the remarkable life and suspicious death of America's first Secretary of Defense and an early casualty of the UFO cover-up, James Forrestal. And Peter joins us now. Hi, Pete. Good afternoon or evening, as the case may be. Pete, the, our last chat back in February of uh, 2020 uh, was about James Forrestal, and I became more interested in the dark side of the the UFO topic, namely government cover-ups and UFO conspiracies. And I noticed uh, a little while ago you did a paper on controversial deaths and UFO investigation with murder, conspiracy, or happenstance. I mean, it sounded pretty mysterious, and I thought we could talk about that today, about the uh, controversial deaths, um, I guess probably since Roswell in, 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 this, uh, in the ufology uh, niche. Uh, yeah, that is true. And um, as I had mentioned to you earlier on off the air, um, this was not a subject I was originally drawn to. Um, and then I was contacted by a conference organizer some years ago who asked me to speak on controversial deaths of researchers, investigators, journalists associated with the subject. My reaction was mm, not my thing, too lurid, very tabloid. It almost always works out that it's coincidence, happenstance, but people love the idea that people were murdered for what they knew. <clears throat> and suggested several other topics I was ready to go on. And his response was, that's nice. Um, I want somebody to speak on this subject for my conference. If it's not you, I'm hiring somebody else. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, well, maybe I can get into this. And so I ended up choosing um, six individuals, uh, eight individuals, six of the men, two women. Um, and ones who I was aware of in terms of UFO history. Um, what ultimately got me really caught up in the paper though, was having been involved in this field for over 40 years and met and being befriended by and making friends with many of the players, well-known, not so well-known, that four of these eight people um, that I was looking into originally kind of as an academic exercise had become friends of mine. And I was essentially investigating the possibility of the murder of four people who I cared about. Mm -hmm. And um, I investigated for quite a number of months using every source imaginable. And um, some of the individuals that I looked into <clears throat> the circumstances surrounding their deaths <clears throat> may be known um, to uh, audiences in the UK, in some cases, maybe not. And very briefly, I'll go through them and what I deduced <clears throat> relative to um, America's first Secretary of Defense, James Vincent Forrestal, uh, who I spent an inordinate amount of time on uh, going back to the 1980s his life fascinated me as ultimately did his demise. Americans were brought up to understand that he uh, had a tragic nervous breakdown in the spring of 1949, which he did uh, on the very day that he stepped down from uh, his office as first secretary of defense, it fully manifested itself. And if we're to understand the official line uh, he took his own life by going out the window of the Bethesda Naval Hospital in the state of Maryland on May 22nd, 1949. In fact, my research um, confirms, certainly for me and other people who have studied what I was able to present, um, that he was murdered, that he was forced out of that window. And the documentary is not a book. It's actually a one-hour, very modest documentary. Um, We've all become very uh, sophisticated viewers with everything that's available online and in film and television these days. And this is no real bells and whistles. It's me, a green screen, a one hour script, a number of images, mm -hmm. film clips, the story of his life, the story of his uh, decline and breakdown, 
and then the story of his murder and then my investigation into it. So I'm not even going to talk about Forrestal here in that respect. It is a full separate story. Yep. Uh, my first individual I looked into was when I first became involved in the subject of UFOs uh, quite obsessively and very quickly, um, more than 40 years ago, one of the early authors who earned my respect, and there were so many goofballs and mystics and you know, contactees and welcome the Space Brothers types. Uh, we had Donald Kehoe, who is a wonderful uh, pragmatic writer, a decorated uh, Marine fighter pilot um, uh, during World War II. Um, but the other really quality investigative writer from that period of time of the 1950s for me was M.K. Jessup or Morris mm -hmm. K. Jessup. Um, he wrote a number of outstanding books that I felt were ahead of their time and um, had a background in mathematics, anthropology, uh, studies in ancient civilizations, became more and more introverted, um, more and more isolated scientifically, ultimately ending up taking his life. But there were anomalies around the suicide and yet there, were very clear, there was a very clear evidence, too, that he had gone into a very genuine, very deep depression uh, and had signaled to certain people close to him that he was considering ending his life, including a suicide note or an alleged suicide note. At the same time, um, no autopsy was performed. He allegedly took his life by running a hose from his exhaust pipe into a window, stuffed the window, opening with wet rags around the opening for the hose, turned on the engine in a small park in Florida, and was found dead in the morning. Part of the problem there was that there was no container in the car, like a small bucket with water with rags, that he could have used to do that from the inside. Right. So we have kind of a double mystery there. and. Um, a number of the cases that I investigated essentially had to be left in what Stanton Friedman, the late great UFO investigator, used to call his gray box, unresolved. Uh, next person up was um, a very well-known American newspaper columnist, media personality, uh, early television personality, and that she was a, um, uh, a reoccurring um, uh, member of a a very popular 1950s television show called What's My Line, mm -hmm. where well-known folks would come on uh, or people with uh, interesting backgrounds and the well-known guests would guess who they were. Uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, um, in one sense, was that. She was a New York-based, you know, uh, know all the celebrities type, uh, go to the nice clubs and meet with the movie stars at night, but she was also an outstanding investigative writer. And following the assassination of John Kennedy, she became deeply involved in investigating his death. In fact, she had the distinction of being the only journalist ever to be able to get in to the jail in Dallas to do a one-to-one -one interview with Jack Ruby, wow. the man who shot Lee Harvey Oswald before he himself expired of cancer, or so we're led to believe. Um, Kilgallen was found dead in her bed in her New York apartment. Um, however, uh, there were all, oh, she also became very involved in the UFO subject, and including being um, uh, deeply involved in the possibility of a crash mm -hmm. uh, that had occurred in America. Um, she also became very involved with certain figures in the British government relative to this subject. Um, Gordon Creighton, who, uh, as many of your listeners know, was the editor and I believe founder of uh, the Flying Saucer Review, uh, they corresponded, and uh, he felt that she was on to something as well. Um, Timothy Good uh, also had great respect for Kilgallen. Um, 
and again, she was found dead in her bed. And there were so many anomalies to the physicality of the situation. Um, she had a, a confidant, a very close friend who was her hairdresser, who had made it clear that um, first she was wearing something that she would have never worn to bed. She wasn't wearing her reading glasses, which she would have had to, they were someplace else. She was in the wrong bed in her apartment. Um, the book that was propped up in her hands when they found her was upside down mm -hmm. and so on. Um, in ufology, people that have picked up on this story have not surprisingly pointed to the likelihood that she was murdered for what she knew about the subject of UFOs, possible crash, um, working with insiders, networking with people within Her Majesty's government. Um, I am convinced that she was murdered. There's no question about wow. that in my mind. However, I think it had to do with what she knew and learned about the Kennedy assassination and the fact that she made a crucial error of making it public that she was going to be writing a book on this. By the way, when her apartment was searched, all of her research files on Kennedy were gone. Gone, yeah. So that was that about her. One of the, the deans of scientific ufology in America was a brilliant um, atmospheric physicist named James E. MacDonald, who died in 1970 or 71, um, and whose work is as worthy of our attention now as it was back in the 60s. Um, MacDonald um, is one of my personal heroes in the work, and he is alleged to have, he committed suicide uh, with the handgun. Um, but it's one of those cases where I, I don't think it was physically set up that somebody shot him and then made him appear to have shot himself. Right. But he was driven to it to a tremendous degree, um, in part by the uh, godfather of American debunking, Dr. Donald K. Menzel, who lived a double life uh, as part of the American national security apparatus and as a very distinguished academic as the head of astronomy studies at Harvard. So uh, he was also um, kind of the godfather and patron of America's best known debunker, uh, the late Philip Klass, who I don't miss at all. No. <laughs> um, anyway, MacDonald became so committed as a respected scientist to the importance of this subject. He had had a sighting with several friends, but as he began to really study it, he became obsessed with it. It hurt his family life. It hurt his professional life. Uh, the ridicule piled on. He was at one point in the late 60s called to Congress to testify about what became um, the Concorde, the SST, supersonic transport, and whether it was viable, too much pollution or what have you, uh, because he was an expert um, on um, atmospheric physics. And a particularly vicious American congressman, Congressman Ryan from my mm -hmm. home state of New York, having learned that he was interested in flying saucers, tore him apart um, in open hearings, which caused him much depression. Um, ultimately, he estranged his wife, who loved him very much, but literally drove her away. Um, she ultimately got involved with somebody else, fell in love with somebody else, but stood by him to a degree, as did their daughters. Um, but he descended into depression. He is losing work, um, losing his credibility as a scientist, and shot himself, but was unsuccessful legally blinded himself though in the process. She helped nurse him back to relative good health. Uh, ultimately though, um, they couldn't keep track of him every moment and he ended up literally calling a cab, yep. going to Phoenix, getting a gun, going out into the desert and killing himself. Uh, I still feel angry about this, not that I have a right to personally, I never knew the man. 
um, for anybody that wants to know more about him and what happened to him and the extraordinarily important contributions he made to serious scientific UFO studies, uh, the definitive biography uh, by um, the late great um, Anne, um, I'm blanking, um, a book called Firestorm. Um, and, um, Oh, it's covered on my bookshelf. Uh, anyway, uh, you can't go wrong with it. And you can go on YouTube and find um, um, clips of him speaking, often before scientific or journalistic groups, uh, a very important figure. Um, moving along, we go to, um, and obviously here I'm working from some notes, Frank Edwards. Frank Edwards was an extremely popular broadcaster best-selling author, uh, radio personality in the United States in the 50s and 60s. He wrote several huge smash bestsellers, and um, they were all on the paranormal and UFOs. UFOs, serious business, UFOs here and now. Um, he was the first person in American broadcasting to have on as a regular guest Donald Kehoe the first best-selling UFO author in America and outstanding first serious UFO author in America, um, as well as to keep that subject in the public realm and in no uncertain terms. He became so well known on the subject, I think that there was concern that he was just letting too much quality information right. out there for an increasingly large audience. And he was one of the people who I approached uh, when I did my investigation as, I, I don't think he was murdered. He was very overweight, um, you know, kind of an A-type personality character. Um, and at the same time, he, The circumstances surrounding his death, once again, were unusual. Um, he was scheduled to be a speaker at what was then a very important UFO conference in New York City. Um, and it was timed to mark the 20th anniversary uh, of the Kenneth Arnold sightings. Um, for those of your audience who study the subject, you're aware that Kenneth Arnold was a private businessman and pilot who was the first person to observe, quote unquote, flying saucers in modern times and go public with it, uh, having observed them flying in uh, the state of Washington in a, in a rural area as he was in his private plane. Um, however, um, he passed away, um, Frank Edwards that is, a few minutes before midnight on the 23rd. Had he lived the next morning, he would have been the keynote speaker at the Conference of Scientific Ufologists that had been scheduled in New York City for that day. And he had communicated to people before that that he had concerns. So once again, um, I can't say definitively, but evidence points to foul play here, and that's mm -hmm. just the way it is. Uh, I went on from there to look into the death of somebody who was um, somebody I knew and not just somebody I knew, but somebody I considered a dear friend and my first mentor of several in my coming up through the ranks. Uh, had he lived, I think he would have become one of the best known, most influential UFO personalities in history. Um, Pete Mazzola was a tough, no nonsense for me, bigger than life. Italian Catholic American, Brooklyn born, New York City police detective uh, who had been shot, stabbed, beat up, highly decorated by the NYPD, um, and was a crack UFO investigator. He was the first person I knew who was seriously looking into UFO related abductions. And Pete in the 1970s had been specially trained under the auspices and budget of the New York City Police Department 
to learn to master regressive hypnosis for criminal investigation and help to break a number of important cases. Uh, it's almost needless to say that he took a certain amount of good natured teasing from brother officers uh, relative to his interest in flying saucers. But he was such a good, solid cop and a great detective that even the John Jay Police Academy in New York, where police officers are still trained, um, allowed him to use their voice stress analysis technology to run first generation audio tapes through it. Now you can get it for a laptop. Right, and it was yeah. bulky technology. And um, he was the, the second person that did a regressive hypnosis on me to try to see if there was any more detail that I could recall from my childhood siding with my sister. Uh, he was the first person that did regressive hypnosis with Helen. And she, in fact, had had an abduction experience at that time. And that was what they were looking into together. Um, in the... 1968, as you know, the um, American government officially went out of the UFO investigative business. I think officially is the operative word there because it was total BS. They never went out of the business. No. The Air Force continued to operate its investigations. But up until then, if you lived, you know, small town America somewhere or, you know, even a bigger town, and you had a legitimate sighting, um, often one that was in the paper the next day and other people had too, you would more likely call your local police department about it rather than the United States Air Force mm -hmm. in Washington or your local air base or something, although people did that too. And Pete did something very ahead of his time. He put together what amounted to an American police officer's lobby against UFO secrecy. Many law enforcement personnel were very interested in this subject. They're out, they're observing, they're trained observers. Um, many of them are former military. And uh, their accounts, for all the right and wrong reasons, are often considered more credible than, you know, Joe Blow, who's not some kind of official person. Anyway, um, at the height of the organization, there were also civilian members, myself, I had the... Um, uh, honor of being the art director for their monthly publication, mm -hmm. but the organization was called the SBI, Scientific Bureau of Investigation, and they had members in every state, um, often calling in with UFO sightings and incidents before it broke in the media or before the government found out. For what it's worth, everybody remember, some of you were too young to, but there was a time when we had landline phones with cords that connected them to the walls. And in the 70s, a great new piece of technology came in called an answering machine. Mm -hmm. Pete was the first person I ever knew who had two separate phone lines in his house. What the heck? And one wow. of them with one of these brand new newfangled answering machines, 24 hours dedicated to taking calls from police officers and other people around the country. In 1986, I think it was 86, Pete took an early retirement. He was only 41 or so at the time. He had been in the, in the police department since I think he was um, out of the service from Vietnam, but he literally committed to joining when he was still a teenager. And he had done his 20 plus years or so and uh, his wife, Elaine, was very thrilled, as were their kids, that he was now going to be able to not subject himself to this kind of danger every day and uh, dedicate himself to the thing he was most passionate about. When Pete was in a horrible auto accident, a lot of people understandably felt that there was foul play. Uh, I among them and myself and my very first contemporary colleague in ufology, uh, Antonio Huneus, both looked into this. We stayed in contact with Pete as he made a slow steaming recovery, never really recovered though. Um, he had been booked to give a talk in Ohio or somewhere in the Midwest uh, shortly after his retirement. And um, he was picked up by his sponsor at the airport, 
They were driving to um, the uh, motel where he'd be staying overnight. And for whatever reason, he didn't put on a seatbelt. And here's where you say to yourself, no, mm -hmm. sorry, it's not murder. It's not foul play. It's the insanity of chance happenstance. Uh, divided highway, a car on the other side of the highway, but you know, also on the inside track, blew a tire and jumped the divider and went straight into their car. Wow. And he broke about every bone in his body. And um, after a year, he, his recovery, even though he, it's amazing he lived, it just wasn't making sense. They finally did something they should have done immediately, which was a full CAT scan as well as x-rays. And they found that at, by then, he had a brain tumor. It was inoperable. I spoke to him about a week before he died last time. It was leading up to the 40th anniversary um, of Roswell, Kenneth Arnold, major uh, anniversary. Uh, and MUFON was having what for me, I, I've never been to lots of their international symposia, but I have been to some. This was my most memorable one. It was in Washington, DC. And he said, if I can get myself down there somehow, would you watch out for me and push me around in my wheelchair and things? I said, sure. But he died the week before. So God rest Pete Mazzola. Um, and the organization, which was very much like Bud Hopkins Intruders Foundation, um, it was run on not just the good work they did, but the charisma of the organizer, so that um, it went when Pete went. And that is a real shame. Dr. Carla Turner, uh, a psychologist, an abductee, and a mental health professional who focus in on a scientific study of the abduction phenomena, um, for me had, um, was another person who I considered true friend and somebody I have uh, nothing, I had nothing but undying admiration and respect for. Carla was maybe 4'11 and weighed 100 pounds, but she had more guts than all the guys I knew in terms of UFO investigation. And we had concerns. Um, there were people who wanted to shut her up. And I usually don't wax this way, but there's also some reason to believe that they, these other intelligences, who she did not think well of, um, were also not thrilled with Mm -hmm. her books and her lectures. And um, Carla developed um, cancer and died from it. Um, she was just 48 years old at the time. I saw her a few weeks before the last talk she ever went to it was a talk uh, in part that I gave in Chicago. And I will always miss her. Um, she wrote several remarkable books, including uh, Taken, uh, inside the Human Alien Abduction Agenda, Masquerade of Angels, and Into the Fringe. All of them still very much worth your reading time. Now we come to somebody who became one of my dearest friends over the years in ufology, a true inspiration to me, one of my favorite human beings of all time, and somebody whose death I mourn every September when it, the anniversary rolls around. And that is the late, great Graham Birdsall. Uh, Graham I just, needs no introduction for many in the UK. He was uh, co-founder and editor-in-chief of the greatest English language print magazine on the subject of UFOs, as far as I'm concerned, ever, at a time when print magazines were still viable. He was a rarity among my colleagues in that he was not just a total kick-ass investigator. He was um, driven. He was smart. Uh, he was incredibly courageous. And uh, he never minced his words. If 
he felt that you were trying to fool him mm -hmm. or the people at large. He has showed you no mercy. Uh, if he felt you were doing good work and had courage and were helping advance the cause, he was your best friend. Um, I was lucky enough to speak at a number of his wonderful um, conferences over the years in Leeds and elsewhere. And uh, many of your listeners, I'm sure, had the great pleasure of attending. He was about as great a conference organizer as he was a publisher. He also was a good businessman. He actually was able to make a living for himself and his family and people that worked for him running this terrific publication and the um, brilliant conferences that ran for 20 years. Um, I would stay with Graham and Christine um, when I would visit Leeds. My very first trip to York was with him. And as a little boy growing up in New York, uh, I had a grandfather who helped me understand history and that my city was named after a very old city and a kingdom across the ocean. And I thought, wow, oh, York, New York, I get mm -hmm. it. Yep. Someday I'm going to visit the original and nobody else in the world better to visit with. Um, Graham died of the effects of a cerebral hemorrhage. And he joked with me um, at times that he always felt he was never going to live past 50. My first thought was that's kind of creepy and weird. But he went on to explain that um, his father, his grandfathers, um, the men in his family died by about that time. He was also um, a very much a, a type A personality. He was driven as well as being a driver. Um, he His diet <laughs> was not oriented toward health food. No. Uh, like the best of us, he could knock him back. And um, he packed more into his 50 years than most people ever will into 100. The only time I ever came over to the UK, my 20 odd visits uh, that I've made uh, over the years, the only time I ever came over specifically to go to um, a memorial and a funeral was uh, when Graham died. I love the guy. Um, I will always hold him close. I stay friends with his daughter, Helen, who lives here in America, in New York State, um, married an American. And um, if there are three people in your audience who don't know who he is, they should. Okay. Uh, going on, getting toward the end here, um, to another person who I feel incredibly fortunate to have met. Uh, he threw Bud Hopkins, uh, whose assistant I was for many years, uh, was the late great Dr. John Mack. Uh, John Mack was a professor of psychiatry at Harvard University. Uh, he was a distinguished clinician as well. He was co-founder of the psychiatric wing of Cambridge Hospital, just outside of Boston. Um, and he was a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, uh, not for anything to do with UFOs, but he wrote a brilliant psychiatric biography of T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. Wow. Um, John was known to me some years before I met him in a completely other way. Um, although it's an institution in the UK and what we used to call Commonwealth countries, um, America has a few offices um, of the wonderful organization Samaritans International. And I'm very proud to have worked as a, uh, a Samaritan phone line volunteer and shift supervisor um, for eight years, um, for those years just as a volunteer, for as a volunteer and supervisor out of their busiest office in America. Um, and John, among his many credentials in mental health, was a, um, a expert on adolescent suicide. And um, I had read one of his books on that subject uh, doing late night shifts when it was quiet. 
And so when I learned that he wanted to visit Bud Hopkins, um, I was intrigued because, you know, John had the, uh, the connections and the credentials we had all dreamt of that somebody might yeah. have in this field. Um, we knew that he had never been involved in this subject. And as he told me after the fact, with a lot of laughter, uh, he had a wonderful sense of humor, and uh, I love the guy, that he specifically came to meet Bud Hopkins because he had heard there was this painter in New York who was convinced that aliens were abducting human beings, which meant he obviously had to be insane and was be a very interesting person to meet. He later was very humbled by <laughs> that first yep. meeting with Bud, and it was changed his life. The two of them became close colleagues and friends, and I had the great good fortune of becoming friends with John as well. Um, John, I should say, was someone who, um, once he locked on to the subject and realized that some people that had had these experiences were not traumatized, but were the more for the experience, expanded consciousness, that these intelligences, at least that they were in touch with, um, seemed beneficent and um, wanting the human race to evolve in a more positive way, etc. Um, and he made no bones about it. And he became the first um, faculty member at distinguished Harvard um, to be censured since Timothy Leary was in the 1960s over his controversial proselytizing and use of um, lysergic acid, LSD. Um, John had to appear before a board with a very expensive lawyer, as he told me, and make his case to Harvard that not only was his work grounded in actual scientific reality, uh, but that it was important work. And he won his case and returned to Harvard with flying colors. In 2004, we lost him. Um, and this, of all of the cases that I've gone over with you just now, um, and this is really the last one that we're looking at, uh, is the one I became most involved in because I was not far away when it happened. John had come over to the UK to speak before the Lawrence Society. It was an afternoon talk. Um, he made his presentation. It was so well received. They asked him if he would give a follow-up talk, more informal, um, after the meal break. And if there was foul play, we're uh, supposed to believe that he was struck and killed while crossing the street by an inebriated lorry driver. Well, uh, at the time, I was in Suffolk, uh, finishing up some work there and visiting with friends. And I was going to be heading to London the next day. And uh, as I did quite a bit in those days, uh, stay over as the guest of my old friend, Nick Pope. Um, and I had called Nick just to check in with him, uh, make sure that everything was good and he'd be around at the time that I arrived the following day. He picked up the phone, said hello, and I had some kind of silly wise guy thing that I said. Mm -hmm. um, Nick, among other things, has a great sense of humor, although you don't always see it, um, but he just went quiet. And I'll never forget, he just said, you haven't heard. I said, heard what? He said, John Mack was, was killed in a traffic accident a few hours ago. Well, my first thought was any sane person in my field's first thought, they got him. Wow. Son of a bitch. Um, if there was one guy to take out, not that he had been involved for the longest time or was the most famous person or even had made the greatest contributions, um, you know, Bud Hopkins was head over shoulders in terms of abduction research, but Bud was, as often referred to, as a painter. 
John was a Pulitzer Prize winning professor from an influential New York City family who knew everybody, who everybody, you know, you know, I mean, he had yeah, it. Yeah. And I went home um, depressed, dejected, but resolved there was something I, I needed to do, which was investigate this on my own. And I got schematics of the whole area. Um, I was able to get part of the hospital records as well as the court proceedings and learn about the man who was responsible for his death, who uh, was on his fifth suspended license, who was more than twice the legal limit for being inebriated, and when you look at the layout of the roads that John was crossing, and you realize that, let's just say, this was a total Manchurian candidate, CIA, three-man hit team with the driver, a completely controlled, you know, program, brainwashed zombie with an earpiece in, et cetera, to come upon that road yeah. and be stopped at that red light at that moment when John at random had decided, I'm going to cross the road now to go have dinner, and then I'm going to come back. I think the kicker for me was, and it's something that might not occur first to um, somebody who lives in um, the United Kingdom, but would to an American who's been over many times, we sometimes forget to look the right way when we're going across the damn street. And True. that may have been what did it, but when that car came around, when that lorry came around the corner, there was no way any more than Pete Mazzola's car accident of a car blowing a tire going over a divider and crashing into the front of another car. Sorry, it wasn't foul play. Um, I almost wish it was. We want <laughs> there yeah. to be meaning. Um, and in fact, um, John's family, who were very noble, very progressive in their thinking, his ex-wife, girlfriend, grown-up children, um, they tried to prevail on the judge overseeing this trial to not incarcerate the perpetrator. Why? Because alcoholism, granted, is a disease. And, you know, it's not that there was any malice involved and blah, blah, blah. I'm not quite that evolved myself. And neither was the judge who unfortunately, due to the way the laws are structured in the United Kingdom, was only able to give him several years and he got off early on good behavior. I don't know, I think he served less than two years. So that's the gist of this, this paper, um, this series of investigations that I did. Um, I think there are always going to be part of the romance, if you will, part of the drama and the trappings of certain people in the field. Um, and usually the louder they are about it, the least likely it is as a reality of, you know, I, uh, I'm really putting my life at risk here by talking about, you know, uh, the fact that I'm giving this information and uh, I'm really courageous and I'm such an insider. I think most of it is BS, but it's real. And there is no question in my mind that the forces that be do keep track of certain people, of course. Um, and every once in a while in the history of um, UFO investigations in the so-called modern age of UFOs kicking in in the summer of 47, we have incidents where there is a possibility that foul play was involved. So we shouldn't get lackadaisical about it and, you know, think like I'm putting out there that there's a lot of, you know, myth and legend and lore 
that dominates here. Yeah. Uh, there is, but there's the reality too. And I know for myself, there was a period of time that I was able to confirm years ago where uh, my home phone was monitored, um, where my mail was occasionally open, where my uh, movements were tracked, especially in the UK for a period of time. I was able to confirm these things by through various people and agencies and offices well after the fact. Um, and it shook me up. Uh, and here I am. I'm fine. You know, obviously yeah. I was not that much of an irritant in the side of officialdom to uh, cause me to uh, have a heart attack while I fell out of a window and was hit by a safe and fell on my sword and ate poison. What? Yeah, I, I just... I just wanted to ask, uh, what what would be the trigger point for somebody to uh, to be monitored? What what would what would trigger the people behind the scenes to want to know what's going on? Um, of course, I don't know definitively. This is simply an educated guess or educated guesses. Um, and anybody that says they know for a fact, take with a grain of salt. Um, I imagine it could be several things. One is that you are really on to something that potentially can cause attention to be directed to an agency or an office or powerful individual or individuals who do not want or need that attention. Um, another might be that it has to do with focus on a location where things are indeed happening um, and where they do not want attention to be focused. One can argue that there have been times that uh, the Rendlesham Forest has acted in that manner, or when we first started hearing about it in, for some of us, the 1980s, um, Area 51 in Nevada. Um, then there are occasionally, I think, media situations. Um, somebody may write a book and without even realizing it, be pointing people toward a case or a reality or individuals um, who really could be the top of a can of worms, so to say. Mm -hmm. The other is, um, interestingly, when... Um, television programs started to deal with these subjects, uh, shows like the original American Unsolved Mysteries, which started in uh, 1980s, and which I was an early guest on, ironically on Rendlesham, no, uh, Rendlesham, well, Rendlesham and Abductions, uh, two separate shows. But I think it wasn't until the iconic X-Files started to roll into our transom that many Americans, and by extension, many viewers around the world, first even heard of America's super secret national security agency. And I mean, the show was a juggernaut. It was an absolute phenomenon. It ran for 10 years. The first seven years, I think, were superb in terms of the research, uh, the stories. After seven years, I think people were making so much money all associated with the show, interest being lost, the quality was not quite up to what it had been, Duchovny wanted out, et cetera. But the most important thing about The X-Files for me overall was in that very first episode, and you can go online and watch the pilot, which is very interesting because we all know the idea of a pilot is to introduce your characters, the idea of what the show's gonna be, give you a sweep of the situation, and they did a brilliant job. Uh, Scully, the doctor, gets stuck with the nutball in the basement there. And on that first day that she goes down there to confront her new partner, up on his wall is this poster with the flying saucer and the words, I want to believe. Yeah. Hello, reality. This is what it all comes down to. We all want to believe something 
is true about this phenomena or not true about this phenomena. And part of it is governed by mm, our longings, our dreams, our fears, our considerations, our religions, our beliefs, uh, and our beliefs can become reality for us, even though they're not real. It can become, in some phases of ufology, uh, the functional equivalent, with all due respect, of religion. I absolutely believe that the earth is hollow and that, you know, other intelligences live in it because I read this book and I saw this documentary and I read that article and Admiral Byrd's, you know, said this and whatever. Or for me, the two, two of the most ludicrous hypotheses, all aliens are good and they want to help humanity mm -hmm. and we want, you know, we're scared of them. We want to kill them at officialdom. All aliens are bad. And, um, you know, some people are so naive that they think, you know, that they're good, blah, blah, blah. After 45 years of obsession, study, professional involvement in this field, I've come to a point where I know how little I absolutely and definitively know. Right, right. <laughs> so many people would say the opposite, but no. For yeah. me, it's what I can prove in court. Peter, an interesting one. Like, would, it, would a man like Marco Rubio, who is a US senator, and um, I mean, this year we've seen the release of the Tic Tac videos, the Pentagon comment about off road vehicles, and then Rubio's announcement that he wants the military to produce a report about its UFO task force. Um, and um, he's a bit concerned about stuff seeing. Uh, flying over military bases or where they do military training, he'd rather, he would feel more comfortable um, if um, if they were Russian or Chinese, so he knew exactly who they were. But we, with somebody like Marco Rubio coming out and 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 wanting a task force to investigate the, uh, the UFO phenomenon, would he be under su uh, surveillance? That's a good question. Um my first impulse would be to say minimally, if at all, because what he's doing, he's doing in the wide open. He's not moving around in the shadows covertly looking into this with the potential of embarrassing the government, for lack of a better term. He's just blurted it out. Everybody in the world now knows that he'd like this to happen. Um, and I'm sure within the offices and agencies here and abroad that govern such things, yeah, why not monitor you know, his communications, at least irregularly, see what he's writing about, see what he's emailing, see what he's talking to other people on the phone about. But no, he's, he's out, so to say. Um, and I think right there is, is a definitive difference. We have had people in officialdom over the years who have been seriously interested in this subject and uh, potentially embarrassing to an agency or an office or powerful individual or individuals that you would wanna cut off at the knees before they went public. Also, what he's doing is fairly low key because we have a really interesting timeline these last few years, don't we? As far as what's been happening and what's been changing in perception of this subject. Um, in the autumn of 2017, a article, a very modest kind of innocuous article on UFO statistics was published in the venerable New York Times. It was written by a New York State UFO statistician, uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Cheryl Costa, and her partner. And um, the thing that was amazing about it was the Times didn't ridicule it. And the Times has been a major player in high level ridicule as opposed to tabloid level ridicule from the get go. Um, it's a subject I've focused in on exclusively for some years, the 
origins of the ridicule factor and this particular very influential American newspaper's part in keeping the subject something to mock. Um, a few months later, a more impacting article was published in the Times on um, the fact that some years before, I think in 2004, um, the Speaker of the House um, had requested funding to the tune of 20 odd million dollars to study the UFO question. And um, it was open knowledge for those of us in the work, but the fact that the Times addressed it uh, and the fact that Leslie Kane, uh, one of the best known if not the best known and most respected, regular, real, respected journalist who has come to uh, be very well known and uh, studied in UFO circles, and Ralph Blumenthal, a respected uh, UFO, uh, a respected staff writer for the Times, as well as another Times staff writer, wrote this article. And that even though it was only in a tiny box, it started out on the front page of that Sunday's New York Times international news section and then continued inside where it was fairly substantial. Um, it, it created what in retrospect for me was something of a phenomena in the media. Um, ridicule had been so tightly wired into the subject that I simply thought it was like a, a momentary passing or a treaty, so to say, or that article was going to be taken seriously, but you know, a few weeks later, it's back to business as usual, and kept waiting, as they say, for the other shoe to fall. It never fell. Mm -hmm. And isn't it interesting now that your traditional news readers in the UK and the US, more and more around the world, uh, when they're reporting a sighting or an allegation or an event or some new government development? Um, the whole wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I'm just reading it, folks. You know, don't think yeah. I believe in flying saucers and little green men. I'm just hired to do this stuff and, you know, wish I could do what I used to and, you know, ask the weatherman, have he seen any flying saucers? Ha, ha, ha. And it's on the left as well as the right. Uh, equally fascinating. It doesn't matter whether it's a Rupert Murdoch per, um, publication or uh, a, a very progressive you know, liberal leaning publication. It doesn't matter whether it's Fox or CNN. Um, everybody is treating this subject seriously now. And this year has been a banner year for developments. Um, they've, many of them have kind of shot by us because we've been kind of preoccupied with something else. Yep. But Rubio's um, take on it, um, for me, it was just a very natural development in the progression of what we've been seeing. Okay, well, Pete, um, I'd like to keep talking. It's, it's fascinating. In fact, I had uh, written down the um, the topic uh, on media ridicule and UFOs to chat about, but maybe we can leave that for another time. I think I that'll be a so. fascinating discussion. I'd be glad to. Peter, thanks very much. Always appreciate your time. Peter Robbins joining us.